I'm Dan Finkel. Rich tasks are a fantastic way to build your students' capability as persevering problem solvers. And games are a great way into rich tasks because they have a way of grabbing and keeping students' attention. Today's game, 1-2-NIM, is one of my favorites. You want to gather counters for students to actually play this game, as well as something for them to write on. As with all rich tasks, we want to think about how to launch to light students' curiosity, how we'll keep them in productive struggle, learning as much as possible, and how we'll wrap up the activity to help them gain ownership of what they've learned. Let's look at the launch. To launch 1-2-NIM, there are a couple things that we want to keep absolutely front and center. The first is that students are going to win and going to lose this game, and they want to be graceful with both. Not only does winning feel good, but losing has value also. Every time you lose, you have an opportunity to get better, get smarter, and take the strategy that your opponent used to beat you and use it in your next game. So it's actually an opportunity to learn. I like to tell students that I'm a 1-2 NIM master. And this lets them know, first of all, that I'm here to have a little bit of fun with them, but second of all, that there is a strategy that they can find that can help them become a 1-2 NIM master also. With every game, I want to bring a student volunteer up to play against me. And then I explain the rules. 1-2 NIM is incredibly simple. There are only two rules. You can take away one or two counters on your turn, and whoever takes the last counter wins. That's it. It's a two-player game. You can't take away zero counters. You can't take away three counters. It's just one or two. So let's see what a game might look like. I call a student up and let them decide whether or not they want to go first or second. They say, oh, I'll go first. And then I say, well, do you, would you like to take one or two? I might let other students give advice quietly by holding up one or two fingers. Say the student takes two, then it's my turn. Well, maybe I'll take two as well. It's their turn, they'll take one. My turn, I take two. They might pause at this point, then take one, I take two. I've won because even though I took two on my last turn, I took the last one. That's the whole game. The point of this demonstration is that students should understand the rules of 1-2-NIM and be ready to play it on their own. You might need to do one or two more demonstrations, but not too much more. The rules are simple, and we don't actually need to get into strategy. The kids should be ready to play and enter the productive struggle on their own. So now we turn them loose to play in pairs, maybe with a third person looking on, and begin the work of this problem. At some point, you'll want to gather the students together and give them a little bit more structure to make their search through this problem more fruitful. There's a key here, which is that playing with 10 counters is quite challenging. And a great thing mathematicians do is make problems simpler for themselves. How can we make this problem simpler? Students might say, well, maybe we can play with fewer counters. Like how many? Well, maybe they'll say five. That would be easier, but can we make it even simpler? Maybe with three, but can we make it even simpler? What about one counter? This is something I like to do. Is there a student who would challenge me to play with just one counter? Of course they can, they go first, they take one, they win. It's fun, but it actually means something. We try with two counters, again, they come up, they take two, they win, then we try with three counters. There's a little bit more to that. Three is a trap, we sometimes call it the three trap. You'll actually wanna go second here to win. And it seems like we're barely doing anything at all, but actually, we have what we need to start creating a table of our winning strategy. And this is the second piece that can really help students overcome 1-2-NIM and get the most out of it. So I like to create a table that says, on this side, the number of counters, and on this side, what the strategy is. With one counter, I'll go first, and I'll take one. With two counters, I'll go first, I'll take two. With three counters, I'll go second. And then my strategy after that is going to depend on what my opponent does. Once you give students this tool, you've actually scaffolded the entire rest of the lesson. Because if they can figure out how to get this table up to 10, they will be able to beat anybody with 10 counters 
and be a one two NIM master themselves. We turn them loose, and even though we'll be helping, they're going to be ready to work and have a direction for the rest of this lesson. Now let's talk about how to wrap this up. To close this lesson, we'll want to pull students together and let them challenge you again. This time, they'll have their table, and they can use that to strategically decide what the best move is. And the wonderful thing about the table is I can literally look and say, oh, there are seven counters. I am going to take one because that's what my table says to do. Just take in how powerful that is. When we organize our information this way, we've literally put all of our thinking into a usable structure that we can use to be NIM masters ourselves and beat the teacher. This is what student ownership looks like. They've built the thing, they can use it, they own it. Students also may notice that there are patterns in this. So it's good to give them a chance to actually share what they notice as they've done this. The pattern of take one, take two, go second, take one, take two, go second, is something that can allow them to extend this table further, at least conjecturally, and even play you, say, with 20 tiles instead of 10. Now, actually playing is fun, but one final thing that you can do in the wrap is suggest that there may be a way to organize the counters to get a little bit more out of what you're doing. And since threes end up being a trap, organizing your counters in a three by whatever size grid ends up being the most helpful way to see what to do. Here's 20 counters. I can tell just by looking at it that my winning move is to take away two, leaving my opponent with a multiple of three. If you're interested in trying some variations of one, two, nim, two natural ways to go are one, two, three, nim, where you can take away one, two, or three counters per turn, or one, two, poison, where you can still take away one or two counters per turn, but the goal is not to take the last counter, but to make the other person take it. It's poisoned, so you want them to have it. Both of those are great. NIM has a ton of other variations as well, and I mention others of those in the write-up. As always, you can find the lesson plan for this lesson in the description below, and it should have everything you need to get started. And let me know in the comments how it went. Were your students able to become NIM masters? Did they even beat the extension games like 1-2-Poison and 1-2-3-NIM? Let me know. I'm Dan Finkel, signing off.